Okay, so today I'm going to talk about our brand new vision for multi-platform application development in Rust, which we have tentatively named Robius. So right off the bat, in a nutshell, what is Robius? So our goal here for this vision is to create a, a multi-platform app dev toolkit completely in Rust, right? With the goal that developers would be able to leverage the robust, safe, and performant Rust ecosystem, which is also quite wide, without the need to complicate things by delving into other languages with a lot of FFI layers, which can often be confusing. Oh, the podium is making an escape. And then I think a secondary concern here is to elevate the, the needs of the mobile experience, to make it a first-class concern within the Rust community, uh, because you know, as we all know, Rust is generally focused on embedded operating systems like myself, and kind of systems programming environments uh, where performance at a low level is needed. Before I continue, just one quick disclaimer. This project is not formally affiliated with the Rust Project or the Rust Foundation, though we do intend to collaborate with various team members of the Rust Project. Okay, let's get started with some motivation behind this project. Uh, so I think we've heard quite a lot, if you've been in the session already today, from various folks who are working in this space uh, about what motivates the need for multi-platform app dev in Rust. But this will be a, a quick review. So application developers do actually want to use Rust. Typically, they're not really sure where to start or how to get started. Uh, this is, in my opinion, uh, due to a paralysis of choice among dozens and dozens of solutions which are not quite complete. And then once they pick one of those mostly incomplete solutions, uh, it's unclear how to integrate them with other disparate projects. Another thing that motivates us is that we want to demonstrate the clear business advantages of a framework like this, just like the business case that a, a framework like Flutter can make. Right? So the, the main advantage of this could be a consistent experience for both developers and customers. Uh, it allows developers to re avoid redundant effort dealing with the minutia of each individual platform, which saves them money and gets their product to market faster. And then, of course, our final motivation, which I think a lot of us share here, is that we just think Rust is great. Of course, I don't need to tell anybody here, but the safety aspect of Rust is nice. Type safety that can lead to memory safety is a blessing for correctness and reliability. It also impacts efficiency of performance, which in the app dev world can give you a nice, responsive, stutter-free UI. And then it has, I think, the potential to unify two of the development worlds that currently exist almost as a split, a sort of a dichotomy in Rust, the systems world and then the front-end app world, which typically don't have too much overlap in the dev space. So ultimately, the goal here is to attract front-end devs to the world of Rust and show them, hey, you know, it's actually not that hard to develop Rust. Uh, we saw this with Makepad. We saw this with Dioxys. And uh, I, I don't think there's a better time to start looking at this and making the case for front-end dev devs to come over to the world of Rust. However, the state of the Rust app dev ecosystem is a little rough at the moment. It's relatively fractured. We have many competing crates. Uh, we've already seen two of the best ones today, Makepad and Dioxys. Uh, one part potential issue here is there isn't really sort of an official recommendation for any specific toolkit or a combination of toolkits. Uh, this can make discovery of crates difficult, and it means there isn't really like a standard approach that a newcomer to the world of Rust app dev can get started with. Lots of these crates offer overlapping features as well, and it's unclear how to integrate them together. You know, if I have 10 different GUI crates and you know, a bunch of different abstraction crates and accessing sensors and accessing touchscreens and all of these different components, how do I actually you know, construct a working application environment for all of these individual pieces? This is in part due to poor documentation, which I completely understand as someone who probably has debatably poor documentation for my own projects. Uh, but we need to lead this effort. We need to create a, a nice series of examples and tutorials so we can remedy this lack of documentation and make it easy for someone to just read a document, watch a video, and figure out how to get started. So if you don't believe me, you can just Google search or take a look at uh, any kind of forum, perhaps the Rust subreddit, and you can see just dozens and dozens of posts about why Rust is bad for GUI or it's good for GUI or which approach do I use, how do I create an application, I have all this criteria, I don't know where I should get started, oh, this framework sucks, this one's hard to learn, okay, Rust isn't suitable because it lacks blah, blah, blah feature, right? There are just so many of these out there 
And I only got, I only took maybe 10 minutes to find these on the internet, right? So we get it, this is a problem. So that's the first motivating point. The second one is that we'd like to make a strong business case for developing applications in Rust. Uh, we can look no further than other applications that have already used Rust to some extent to see what their pain points are and how we could potentially address them. So let's talk about Signal. Signal is a fairly well-known end-to-end encrypted messaging app. I'm a big fan. I use it on all of my platforms. Uh, and as such, I'm sort of intimately familiar with some of the problems they face. So if you're not familiar, Signal is currently implemented in a bunch of separate repositories, but the business logic of communicating with the Signal messaging service backend is written in Rust, so that's nice. But all of the front-end UI components and interacting with the device and the platform APIs are written in native repositories. So on iOS, you use SwiftUI. Android, Java and Kotlin. Desktop uses Electron, so TypeScript, JavaScript. And uh, even their backend is written in uh, Enterprise Java. So in order to actually release functional applications on all of these uh, platforms, they have to maintain a bunch of separate application repositories, and there's not a lot of overlap. These also aren't small. You're talking almost half a million lines of code just for the iOS app. And that excludes the business logic for, for the rest of it. And for Android, 350,000 lines of code. And then for desktop, it's a little smaller, because again, it's electron-based, but still a quarter of a million. So in total, this is over, what, 1.1 million lines of code? That's just dealing with the platform minutia. That's insane. So as you can imagine, it's actually very challenging for a business like Signal, even with being open source and soliciting contributions from the community, it's quite difficult for them to maintain consistency in both behavior and application appearance across all these different platforms. So I've noticed, uh, you know, not to bash them in any way, but I've noticed that, you know, there are Slight inconsistencies, like on some platforms you can't search a particular chat for text, in others you can only search one chat and not all the chats. There's issues with protecting certain chats using like a biometric lock, things like that. Uh, selecting fonts, font choices, these sort of things are, you know, not major deals, but in other application contexts they could be a significant deal breaker or at least a barrier to adoption on one platform versus another. Another case, quite similar to Signal, is Element which is the first party matrix chat client. Matrix chat is a protocol sort of like Slack or Discord, but decentralized and open. So Element is, again, this is the company that created Matrix, so they should know it better than anybody. Uh, they have separate apps and SDKs for each platform, which unfortunately has led to, according to their user reviews on iOS and Android, relatively inconsistent user experiences and buggy behavior on those apps. Uh, so they have a variety of different applications, uh, ignoring the element-x ones here, which I'll talk about in a second. There's four here for the, the different platforms. So a similar case to Signal. Element themselves actually realized the problem with this, and they started a new effort called Compound, which I can best sum up in three words as a design-only flutter. So it's basically a shared language just for the set of uh, the UI components designs and implementations for web, iOS, and Android. And they realized that you know, this wasn't tenable. So that's why they started working on Element X, which is uh, partially in Rust. I'll talk about this in a little bit uh, in, in uh, some future slides. But that's basically uh, another example of folks wanting to use Rust, but not really being able to do it in as nice of a manner as we would like. And then our third motivating factor is we believe Rust is the right choice. As everyone has said many times, it's been the most loved language according to Stack Overflow developer surveys for eight years in a row. I'd like to highlight actually this year is the first time that it became the most wanted. So it's not just a, a you know, past success thing. The, the love for Rust is growing. So I, I still think the time is right to delve into the, the Rust app dev world and make things even better. Actually, when you remove some of the, uh, the other data points here, you can you can look at it in a different way and say that 22% of people want to use Rust over Python, which is only 14%. That, it, it's not an important statistic, statistic, but it factors out the, the folks who are already using Rust. So I'm not sure why they included that in the first place, but the point is it's, it, it has a, quite a following. We'd like to leverage a lot of great features from the Rust world for multi-platform application development. So obviously safety, which can lead to runtime efficiency, 
We don't have to worry about things like garbage collection. We all love cargo, offers easy, clear dependency management. And again, most of these things have already been touched on today, so I'll move on. A big part of Rust, uh, again, from the, the reuse of LLVM and building on top of that is simple targeting of other platforms. That's very nice. And then, of course, we have a wide ecosystem. So I think Jonathan mentioned this as well in his Dioxys talk. Uh, compared to the state of the art Flutter, we have, I think, four times more crates than they have um, projects published on, their, reposit on their, um, their registry. And this spans a lot of different things just beyond app dev. That's what's so key. So another part of the, the motivation behind wanting to use Rust is that there actually are some shortcomings from a UI standpoint. So it's not all daisies and roses. We do have a ways to go. Typically, UI designers are accustomed to inheritance. So when they first see uh, Rust, they typically complain about the lack of familiar object-oriented design patterns. And this is expected. Um, as such, we've seen a lot of the, the brilliant UI frameworks like MakePad and Docs offer a form of inheritance with domain-specific languages and things like that. A common complaint is that it's difficult to realize shared mutable state in Rust. Um, I don't personally agree with this, but I understand what folks are getting at. Uh, if you use a typical closure-based callback pattern, you're going to see your code base littered with things like uh, reference counted and ref cells or the sync safe version arc mutexes. I understand it's difficult. And then the perennial complaint that compilation is slow in Rust. Um, that's not really the case. Nick has already given this talk, so that's a little outdated, but things are uh, rapidly improving. Sorry, this thing keeps coming off. I'll just leave it. Uh, one issue I think that also motivates this further is that Rust is said to have a potentially steep learning curve. And I think that could be even worse when viewed from the perspective of a front-end dev encountering Rust for the very first time. There was a survey from a Flutter consultancy called Very Good Ventures uh, that, that found of their clients, the mobile developers that were already employees in that company needed over three and a half months of retraining to switch from something like React Native or whatever native SDK they were using to Flutter. So Rust could be potentially even worse. However, I think the saving grace is that there's this underlying pervasive theme in the, develop the developer community, excuse me, that switching to Rust will bring you huge gains. So back to the example of Element, they were using Compound, their design-only Flutter uh, design language, and Rust to rewrite their apps, and they supposedly uh, have claimed an improvement of up to 6,000 times increase in performance. Now, a lot of that is not due to Rust, I'm sure, but it speaks to the general attitude surrounding Rust. Right? So if they found that they could switch to Rust and make some other changes, perhaps um, accelerated by Rust, uh, they themselves were motivating a cross-platform platform approach in Rust. So we can look to them and the success that they had and say, oh, if we could have enabled this right off the bat, they wouldn't have had all those poor user reviews in the beginning with their non-Rust apps. But even then, they haven't released all of these different platform support yet because they still do need some platform-specific code. So I think that's pretty sufficiently motivates the need for this vision that collects all of these projects and gives you a nice Rust app dev framework. Let's talk about the specific goals. So we have three main goals right off the bat. One, we'd like to establish a community and drive this flourishing ecosystem of Rust projects that are all related to application development and can be combined together in nice ways. Speaking of combining them, we'd we like to do so in order to create a fully usable reference design of the entire system stack of everything beneath the application layer, such that someone can just grab and go. Uh, personally, I'd also like to get involved to develop a series of flagship apps and also smaller proof of concept reference apps, excuse me, excuse me that uh, give you a, a very specific example of how you can use this framework and other components within it in order to create gorgeous, fast performant Rust apps. And then, of course, we want to do our part and give, some, give something back to the rest of the cargo teams, not just making feature requests, but showing use cases and helping to motivate their future development. I've done this already in my previous OS work, and it's been uh, invaluable for both directions, so I, I anticipate this will go very well. Okay, first up, let's talk a little bit more about the community. I think we need to create a working group. We need to track our status on something like an Are We App Yet? 
uh, website. We saw various folks talk about are we GUI websites, but that doesn't tell the whole story, right? We need something like uh, platform-specific abstractions to talk to the underlying devices. We'd like to collect a set of maintained highly functional projects where we both attract and support those projects across the entire system stack. So that's just about fostering the collaboration between the community and uh, working on integration between projects. I think the key word here is holistic. We want to make sure that we're able to develop a series of documentation, tutorials, videos, you know, what, what not, uh, in a way that brings together many different parts of the ecosystem. And then of course, once we have this, go out, go forth and multiply, evangelize the power of Rust for this specific domain, which is not one that has previously been considered one of its strengths. With that, we'd like to say, hey, you know, it's not just for systems dev, we can do other stuff. For the second goal, a reference design of the full system stack, basically in a nutshell, we want to have a complete working example of everything beneath the app. I already said that. The goal is to support most of the major platforms and operating system environments. This is blurred out. I'll talk about it in coming slides. But that's, I think, the, the key point. As I mentioned, we also want to create a series of proof of concepts for applications as well as a flagship app. So these will be open source. They'll be ready to use examples. Someone can just grab them off the shelf and modify them as they see fit. We'll lead with one, perhaps two, major enterprise-grade flagship apps. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then I also want to mention our kind of overarching goal, which is these should be very easy for new developers to look at, understand, fork, and modify, right? That's the, the promise behind open source. So they should be very well commented, very well structured, documented, and outlined nicely with, you know, perhaps accompanying videos and explanations. So one such idea for a flagship app, probably will come at no surprise, something like a matrix chat client. So a good existing example of this would be Element, but a better one would be something like Fluffy Chat, which is a cute version of a matrix chat client written in Flutter. But th the key point here is that it has a very consistent behavior because of the, the, the underlying framework that was used to write it, Flutter. It still does require some platform-specific code, and I think that's okay. There, you're probably never going to get around this. Um, but it has a, a very nice set of underlying primitives that it can use thanks to Flutter, and it, it offers all of these nice features that you know, Elements app doesn't, right? Accessing you know, multimedia, a camera, a microphone, doing video chat, things like that, handling persistent state. Once we have this, I think our final goal is to advertise the business value of a vision like this. So when you have such a framework, you'll be able to attract developers and customers via a consistent user interface and user experience. A, a business would be able to hire fewer developers and they could pick and choose ones with deeper expertise in whatever domain of the application they're building rather than expertise in a specific platform. It's frequently easier to maintain uh, cross-platform applications when you don't have to worry about the underlying platform uh, minutia, which will give you better, more consistent bug fixes. We also want to demonstrate that it's very easy to integrate the rest of Rust's very large and very wide crate ecosystem with this, uh, this framework uh, and leverage the, the deep ecosystem beyond, specifically beyond UI. As opposed to something like Flutter or React Native, this would be a, a more decentralized distributed project structure, uh, must, much like the Rust project itself. Of course, it'll be open source like others. But a business may not have to worry about you know, something suffering the Google graveyard or another similar uh, fate. And then, of course, last but not least, you get to use Rust. OK, so let's talk about the requirements here. There's quite a few requirements that you could uh, enumerate for a project like this, but I've selected just a, a few here, just six, and split them broadly across things that need to happen at runtime versus things that are more pertinent to build time and developer tools. So let's start with the first one, which is about efficiency and high performance. So once you have that, you can realize high responsiveness and low input latency, which we've seen with frameworks like MakePad and Dioxys. 
we can realize energy efficiency, which is particularly important on mobile platforms and embedded, and even in, in cases where we're not constrained by battery power. So how do we get there? What, what's the uh, underlying things we need to hit this requirement? Rust helps us out a lot, right? It has no, no underlying runtime required, no concurrent garbage collector. Uh, you get the benefit of a lot of con uh, constant evaluation and, and compile time safety and doing other things at compile time. One thing that we need to do also is to avoid slow communication with the platform. So we've seen quite a few projects come up that attempt to bridge Rust or other languages with existing native frameworks. And typically you'll see a lot of serialization and expensive marshalling of data over IPC in order to uh, get your application data to the underlying framework, and that, that kills efficiency. And then we also want to provide a full system profiling tool such that developers can isolate exactly where slowdowns are, not just in their application, but perhaps in the way that they're using the underlying stack in order to rectify that. Second requirement is that applications start up fast. We've already seen UI toolkits tackle this well. Uh, there's been quite a few surveys. Uh, for example, Amazon has a famous one where they said every 100 milliseconds of latency cost them 1% in sales. Uh, Google has a similar survey where every half a second in search page generation reduced their traffic by 20%. And you can find similar surveys for mobile applications and their startup time. Typically, a guideline is somewhere between one and a half to two seconds. Uh, upwards of five seconds for a completely cold start for an application. So we should target something around the lower uh, bound of that. The good part of Rust here for, this, for hitting this requirement is that it does full AOT compilation, fully ahead of time. So there's no potential jank from uh, compiling things just in time right at startup. This gives us more consistent general performance at a theoretically lower max performance level, but consistency is the key here. Uh, one potentially bad thing about Rust is that it, it is often said to have large app binary sizes, but there are ways to mitigate this, so that's something we will need to be concerned with. Uh, as a side benefit, as, as we saw with MakePad and with other frameworks, um, having a very fast iterative development cycle is really key, so this helps contribute to that too if your app boots up really fast. Uh, third requirement here is quick compilation. Right? So like I already mentioned everywhere, uh, already mentioned before, everyone seems to think that the Rust compiler is slow. I don't know about that, but uh, a lot of work has been done on that. These UI toolkits that we saw earlier today do a great job of combating this with live or hot reloading, specifically of their domain-specific language elements. And uh, another way that we can tackle this is by structuring the project in the proper way as a bunch of small crates such that we can benefit from parallel compilation. At the very least, if we can't get fast compilation of the entire stack from a clean build, we want to target fast incremental compilation. So, okay, I'm kind of running out of time here, so I'll move quickly. Uh, our next requirement is that we just want to be consistent across the platforms, such that developers never are required to dive into the, the platform-specific code, but they should be able to do so if they want to with relative ease. Uh, we also want to, secondarily, we also want to ensure that platform agnostic code isn't imposing significant overhead. So again, in line with Rust's theme of zero cost abstractions or low cost abstractions, such that we can hit as close to uh, the underlying native performance as possible. We'd also like to allow developers to incorporate arbitrary components, uh, specifically the build, the build system and tooling should be able should allow you to add in custom dependencies from the ecosystem or from your local registry, where, wherever it may be. Uh, in the future, we'd like to be able to support uh, a choice of one or one of multiple UI toolkits, perhaps combining them in unique ways. I'll discuss this in a moment. And uh, even mix and matching and replacing the existing recommended reference design components with your own. And then finally, as David just touched on, we want to be fully compliant with all of the policies that each one of these platform publishers has, such that an application package you generate with this framework would be publishable to an app store with little resistance. Right? So we need to adhere to those policies, and that, in, that includes things like not abusing private APIs, not doing JIT, not bundling in arbitrary executables into your application, the like. So what would a reference design for this look like? I want to just briefly touch on what we think the system architecture could look like. 
uh, with the goal of incorporating many components across the open source ecosystem. We'd uh, integrate UI toolkits, potentially game engines, uh, abstractions of the OS platform, uh, Rust-friendly interfaces to the underlying native SDKs, as David mentioned, concurrency abstractions, uh, multitasking async runtimes, and then as Preston mentioned at the very top of today's session, uh, in the future, something like client-side libraries for these remote services, like Google Mobile Services, through something like Open Mobile Hub. But that's a, a future goal. First, we'll, we'll target the local device infrastructure. So why do I call this a reference design? Uh, we want it to be a pre-integrated solution to give the app developers a known working experience to create these, these nice Rust apps. I don't think it will behave exactly something like Flutter. Right? It won't be uh, you know, a, a singular tool that you have to use in the way that they tell you. Um, but we do want to provide a, you know, just off-the-shelf usable uh, structure. We'll architect this as a series of loosely coupled components that are reusable elsewhere, uh, such that if you want to, you could customize it. So here's a rough sketch of what something like this could look like. We have the application up top, we have UI toolkits, these concurrent runtimes, something like Osiris to provide the abstractions for the underlying platform. And the, the UI toolkits do a great job of already addressing um, the UI needs. So our guiding philosophy here is to stay out of their way. We'll let them do what they do best. You've already seen the expertise on display from uh, Rick's talk and from Jonathan's talk earlier today. So we'll let them act as the active drivers. And then these other components will act as more of passive libraries that will be driven by the application logic in the UI. We also want to explore the ability to flexibly integrate one or more uh, different UI toolkits, such that the developer can cho choose whatever UI model they're most familiar with. So if you're coming from React Native, maybe it's easier to get started with Dioxys. This can kind of lessen the steepness of that uh, that learning curve that new developers often face when they, they hit Rust. We are even interested in bringing together UI and game engines, something like Bevy, such that the game engine could be in control of the main application flow and then sporadically choose to incorporate UI components where needed to make their lives easier, right? Or components from Osiris or the like to uh, implement non-gameplay functionality in a simpler manner. So for the flagship app, something like a matrix chat client, we can expand this diagram and dive in a little deeper. I don't have time to get into this today. But the goal here is to develop one of these in order to help steer uh, the features that we need from projects like Osiris and the integration with these existing UI toolkits and help kind of bring this collaborative world together. OK, just on time. All right, so that's. Pretty much all I have today. Uh, all I just want to say is that this is a brand new endeavor. Uh, we're just starting this journey. I hope to have a announcement about a working group coming soon, and then maybe sometime by mid next year, some version of this initial pre-alpha reference design ready to go. You know, probably with just a few platforms. Um, but we've already seen great status updates and project project reports from all of the various folks involved in these these uh, targeted works here. So I think the future looks bright for a vision like this. OK, well, that already happened. So, <laughs> If you're interested in getting involved or learning more or contributing, please reach out to me. I'm at Kevin A. Booth on GitHub, and there's my email. Thanks very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Though, like I said, this is new, so I may not have any satisfactory answers. Thank you. Any questions? Are there any questions from the audience? And we also have a panel coming up, so you can save questions for any of us then. If you have a question, you can ask them now. Wait a few minutes. The panel members will be in front of you and talk to any of the audience. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Kevin. All right.